And we have Dan with us today to primarily talk about the, um, the science uh, of, of alchemy, this very, very interesting and uh, esoteric uh, teaching, as it were. We're going to get into this in some more detail later on in the program, but uh, at the beginning we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Dan's background and uh, uh, present a little bit some of his uh, work to you. Uh, I also want to mention his website that you can take a look at right away. It's goldenmean.info. Uh, goldenmean.info. And it's a website uh, simply packed with information. It's articles, uh, images, uh, graphs, and videos. There's so much for people who are new to dance work to dig into right there. Uh, but with that, uh, welcome to the uh, program, Dan. Thank you very much for coming on. It's uh, great of you to spend some of your time with us here today. Thanks, Henrik. I'm enthused to share. It's great. It's great to have you with us, and, and again, as I mentioned here, your website is, is vast. There's just tons of material on there for people to dig into. So what I like to do in a way of kind of introducing you and I guess some of the work that you uh, have presented on your website, uh, I guess you primarily use this as a kind of a platform where you uh, present your findings and the new things that, you, that, you, uh, do, that you're researching. And um, maybe you, you can just tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this or if you have any uh, academic or scientific uh, education or in, in, in the background, so to speak, here. Uh, and, and also, if you will, um, how uh, maybe you can mention to us a little bit about how your uh, the main thesis, I guess, of, of your work or, or how this has been developed for you in regards to the golden mean or, or the golden ratio. Yes, a lot of wonderful stuff. Well. You know, we, I've been traveling and teaching for almost 30 years. I have a wonderful partner, Valerie, here, and we have a, a million hits a month on our website. Um, <clears throat> currently, the focus of the work is that, in fact, fractality or self-similarity idealized by the golden mean ratio is, in fact, the, the mechanism behind all centripetal forces, and that would include the cause of gravity and the cause of color, the cause of perception, the cause of bliss, um, and the cause of life force, actually. Uh, and indeed, it is the precise mechanism called grail and uh, alchemy, the, the black hole principle, which is what alchemy is about. So it's about fractality. That's what it is. And um, so, but you asked about my background. That's a good place to start. Yes, yes. So I, I was um, educated at University of Detroit. Initially, my undergraduate work was electrical engineering, magna cum laude. My graduate work, which was incomplete, was a master's in psychophysiology and basically um, biofeedback. I was a polygraph operator. In our graduate research lab, we were the first to discriminate with my mentor, Albert X, who was one of the inventors of biofeedback. We were one of the first to discriminate the electrical nature of emotion, particularly fear and anger. Really? And so it, it set me on a lifelong involvement in teaching and actually inventing biofeedback devices. Currently the heart tumor and the bliss tumor are my inventions. And the concept of heart coherence, I'm credited in the literature with inventing because I developed the math to measure heart coherence and later taught heart math to take their first EKG and how to do the spectrum analysis of the EKG. So it's been a long, a long time, but yes. mostly the focus has been around the physics of consciousness, which is what we call many of our seminars. And recently with the Feng Shui seminars .com, teaching the physics and the science behind Feng Shui. Uh, after uh, university, um, I was a systems analyst trained with IBM. I trained in Detroit, Chicago and Poughkeepsie, although I was only with them for a year. I, it turns out that my teacher in the IBM mm. systems analyst training school was a student of Gurdjieff and Mm, Long really? story, I, I ended up in the uh, in the Gurdjieff uh, Sacred Gymnastics uh, Training School, uh, Sacred Academy in Claymont.org in West Virginia, and learned sacred gymnastic and bliss dance, as well as the Gurdjieff uh, worldview, the Enneagram, and all that stuff. So I was trained in that tradition. And then I, I was a, a working um, electrical engineer for many years, although during that time I I traveled, I, I had, um, I guess you would call it deep initiatory experiences in, in the pyramids and in, in, in Peru and in, um, in Scandinavia. And, you know, I've traveled, traveled too much, actually. <laughs> well, I mean, again, your background is, is uh, you have so, so much uh, that you've been, been studying in so many different fields. And I guess that what is interesting to me is that you've been in electrical 
uh, engineering and many people of course looking into this idea of the, about the electrical universe and even the electrical nature of of the human body for instance so would you say that that is something was that has laid the ground if you will for your discoveries when it comes to um, uh, when you talk about human emotion for instance that that they actually are il- electrical in nature yes that's exactly what we're saying precisely that I- even as the plasma universe people are talking about modeling astrophysics as as waves of plasma and clouds of plasma it's also true that that's what happens during emotion is that you have a coherent emotion you get fractal you implode and that organizes the plasma field you call your aura and its fractality is a measure of your bliss and a measure of whether you will take memory through death in i, I wanted to say in terms of um my background that i've been privileged to work personally extensively with some of the world's most wonderful teachers and i'd i'd like to mention some of their names i was yes. i spent years working with ben bentoff um he called me his his uh, guardian angel at one point and i of course worked with arthur young and I worked with bucky fuller personally for a long time we worked in several cities together i i um i trained with um oh uh well i bill tiller was a friend and andrew puhark was close and Currently, I work a lot with Elizabeth Brauscher and uh, just uh, you know some of the world's greatest teachers and and Professor Karatkov in St. Petersburg, the GDV. He's been very close to me in the last couple of years, and so you know I've I've been privileged to be trained with the best. Really, that's very uh, Arthur Young. Is that the guy behind Bell Helicopters? Yes, yes. Um, really, I stayed really? at his estate in Pennsylvania and played with his Rolls Royce collection and discussed <laughs> deep philosophy about his his reflexive universe. And, I mean, I. I knew I was privileged to be with all the best teachers of the day, Bill Tiller and all those people were friends. That's interesting because I've heard a lot about, well, I don't know if they had a particular name, this group, but I know that Puharich, as you mentioned, Andrea Puharich, yes. Arthur Young mm-hmm. and a few of these other people, they were very, yes. very interested in different spiritual uh, yes. fields. Isn't that right? Mm-hmm. They were into yeah. the... Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, t- the turning point in those days was something called the Fundamental Physics Group at Berkeley with Elizabeth Rauscher was leading, and we've had so much fun even recently. And now she's with Nassim Haramine sometimes, and he's also a friend. But then there was the big International Physics of Consciousness Symposium in Toronto and also at the Harvard. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we were together with Tiller and Bill Tiller and Ben Toff and Puhark. And it was a big party there for many years. We were with that group. So I was kind of the whiz kid of that generation. Oh, really? Well, that's that's really interesting. And and have, have you guys worked together with, uh, well, let us say, larger uh, c- corporations that have, that have been in some way shown interest in these t- type of fields because they want to know more, they want to in some way maybe uh, ha- have inventions or they want to utilize this knowledge in regards to medical industry or, or have you pretty much funded your own work? How's that came, come about? Well, you know, of course I was with IBM for a long time and then our family business in Western New York, I was the Sparky the electrical engineer and I was doing alternative electric motor nonlinear energy device technologies uh, like Bruce De Palma was a friend, and Tom Vallone actually lived with me for a while. So all the nonlinear energy device technology people, and I did keynote lectures for many years for Psychotronics International in USA. But uh, actually, in terms of large corporate support, I think we were too uh, rebellious and revolutionary, <laughs> <laughs> but for many years. But uh, so I've I've been on my uh, on my own focus for a long time, and uh, I've kind of uh, not looked back. You know. Yes. How how about these days? I mean, do you feel that uh, there's a uh, more interest about these type of uh, subjects, or, or is it still uh, on the same level as it were when you first started out? Well, you know, um, governments and institutions are very entrenched. And, uh, you know, I I lectured at um, to the Ph.D. medical students with uh, Gary um, in the um, University of Arizona, Tucson um, Medical School in the cardiology department. And places like that, and I also lectured to Ph.D. physics students at the University of Pittsburgh. And, you know, they're quite with you when you talk about um, coherent emotion using power spectrum measure harmonics. But when you start talking about fractality being the cause of gravity, and that was 15 years ago, they, they I mean, they, they thought you were crazy. And now the best mathematicians in the world, El Mashi and others, have agreed with me that fractality is the cause of gravity. But at that time, you know, it was like too far out. Hmm. Uh, uh, in regards to uh, Nassim Harriman, who we had actually on this program a while back now, uh, are, are you uh, have you split in 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 regards to what what you guys are working on in, independently, or or do you still feel very much that he's 
still on the ball and and is that in accordance with your i guess main theory that you're developing well you know nasim is a great guy and i have great respect for him and he was kind enough to come to the first international budapest international physics of consciousness unified field symposium at my suggestion um, and then I sponsored him at our recent Physics Conscious Symposium in Suffolk, UK. Um, you know, we had that fun dialogue for a long time where I was trying to convince them that stellated tetrahedron are not fractal. <laughs> the, the, but the point, Nassim has really come around beautifully. He really sees the universe as being, uh, the, everything is a black hole as a kind of way of putting it, which is what alchemy is about. And he's really come around to the physics of golden mean ratio. He's done some great work on bioactive electric fields. No, Nassim has, has done some good work on teaching. You know, I still joke with him about, you know, if you sell it a tetrahedron, you get powers of two and you do not get fractality. But, <laughs> but, but still, you know, Nassim is a, is a wonderful guy and he's inspired lots of people. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, very nice. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the things then that, you, that you've gone into and maybe we can explain to our audience a little bit about this who, who might not be familiar with the terminology and so forth. Uh, I guess... Why don't we begin talk a little bit about uh, gravity and, and and fractality and how these things uh, play together? This, I guess, is a is a theory then that you've been working on for what did you say about fifteen years, ten years now? Yes, at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, mm -hmm. it, it's really you can express it rather simply that Einstein was correct uh, when he said that the unified field connecting charge to gravity or electric fields to gravity was the key was infinite non-destructive compression. Unfortunately, as we say, no one had taught him what a fractal was, which is precisely infinite compressibility. And so more mathematicians now today, as I mentioned, El Nashi in Cairo, um, who also uh, was to be part of that uh, Budapest conference at my suggestion, um, has confirmed, uh, along with Andre Lind, agreeing with me that the fractal nature of space is actually the cause of gravity. In order to understand that, it's important to be able to visualize an electric field that's fractal. Yes, uh, And that's as easy as imagining a rose. And that is precisely the shape of the electric field that will cause a seed to germinate. And that's the shape of the electric field that is produced by the Shem or the Dolmen called the Garden of Eden, which made an electric field that prevented aging because it was fractal. So physics has been profoundly slow to realize that biology depends on fractal electric fields in exactly the same way that gravity depends on fractal electric fields. Hmm. And, and in what way um, would you say that this then explains that we are, I mean, when we think about the gravity, that this is what holds us to the planet, is how, how does that work in regards to fractal uh, electricity or, or uh, uh, the electromagnetic field? How, how is that? First, yeah. yeah first, first, it's important to conceive that charge that experiences acceleration is the best definition there is for gravity. And if you think of atoms, Atoms make and have gravity to the extent that their nucleus is fractal to their electrons and specifically log function golden ratio in their radii, which is now proven for hydrogen. The ratio of the nucleus electrons is based on golden ratio. Hmm. That's why and how hydrogen makes gravity. So once you know that the only reason atoms have gravity is that the nu nucleus is fractal to the electrons, which invites non-destructive charge collapse. And what that is, that creates a wind moving charge between frequencies non-destructively, which is basically Einstein's definition of gravity. And then on a larger scale, if you see uh, people like our friend uh, Peter Garyev, who was with us in Budapest as well, measuring DNA, making little black holes, little wormholes, the DNA is making gravity because if you look down the top, you see 10 spirals of the golden mean, just like you see in any good fractal. In fact, hmm. every living protein has that pent view for that reason. So, so, so or, or excuse me to interrupt, but are you saying that it, it's that who are who is uh, the force rather than that is keeping our structure together, our human body yes. together? Really? Yes. Well, I'm saying that all that all centripetal forces, including gravity, life force, consciousness, color, perception, are caused by fractality, which in physics can also be called phase conjugation optimized by golden mean ratio. Another way of saying it is optimized translation of vorticity, which was another one of Einstein's words for, for gravity, basically. Hmm. So once you understand what the, what the cause of gravity is, then you can start learning how to hold things together, like human bodies and planets that are having their atmosphere blow away. So this fractality idea is very, very, very important. But, uh, okay, so how, how would this play into, let's say, anti-gravity then? Because a lot of people are, of course, looking at this as a means of propulsion. They're looking at it for other scientific experimentation and things like this would you think uh, would you say that it's possible to 
create our own gravitational field? Of course, of course. Hundreds of scientists have made capacitors that create gravity from Townsend Brown to to uh, Naudin here in Paris. It's very, very common. What no one has explained is a principle. I was the first one to explain the principle of how they work. Huh. But capacitors that are make, make gravity are very, very old. Really? And physicists who are in denial about that are just plain in denial. It's childish. But we, but we haven't seen it implemented yet in, in the mainstream, I guess, then? Or, or, or well, you know, the, <laughs> the CIA has tried to hide it a little bit, but that's pretty stupid. I find that boring. But, <laughs> you know, uh, if, you, if you read, um, what's his name's latest book on magnetohydrodynamics from, um, from galactic superwave theory, um, hmm. uh, yeah, his book, um, he's, he's, the entire book is about... Uh, about uh, how gravity is produced at the thrust edge of the the uh, new stealth aircraft by capacitance. Hmm. Really, that's very very interesting. And so this idea that it would take a lot of energy to create fields like this is that is that is that wrong? We, can we create this with with a small uh, watt or, or voltage, uh, an electrical electromagnetic field? That, that, that's what, in, in this latest article on the web, goldenmean.info slash pole shift, I explained why Einstein should be so embarrassed about that. <laughs> because one of the beautif most beautiful proofs that Einstein was wrong, that it takes an infinite amount of energy to move charge to the speed of light, is a pine cone. The pine cone does it beautifully. <laughs> the pine cone does it by rearranging its capacitors, called seeds, to be fractal. Hmm. Oh, the person's name I was trying to think of is Paul LaViolette. Galactic ah, superwave. Oh, that, okay, so, I know what you, who, who, which so one Paul you mean. Paul yeah. has done some excellent physics around this. Yeah. And and I would stand behind his work on how capacitance makes gravity, investigating Townsend Brown, etc. But going back to the pine cone, you know, the book is called uh, Vortex of Life or Fields of Form by Lawrence Edwards. And he's shown that uh, the geometry of the capacitors in a pine cone is moving in and out of fractality to modulate the amount of voltage that you get from gravity in the same way that a fresh chicken egg produces 10 to 12 millivolts from gravity by being fractal, which defines life. And any biologist that doesn't know that is not a biologist. Hmm. And, and, but but this does, the mainstream of biologists does not know this, right? They're never not teach well, this. They're, they're the same biologists who are living in aluminum buildings, which is proof that they're stupid. <laughs> I think you have because something about the, the, the cage on, on, uh, on your latest article as well, didn't you? The, the fact that uh, if you put something into a cage, like seeds and whatnot, it actually dies, right? That's right. It's right. I mean, plant seeds in an aluminum cup and you'll watch them die. Plant the same seeds, seeds in a paramagnetic stone cup, you can watch them live. The difference is called a phase conjugate dielectric, which is another name for a fractal field. So fractal fields create life. Fields which are not fractal create death. Hmm. And that's what aluminum and steel buildings do. They are stupid. And, and it, the, Basically, they prevent your aura from achieving pro charge propagation efficiency. Really? That defines life. And, and so, and that's measurable. Uh, sorry to cut you off, but that doesn't, it has nothing to do with the shape or even geometry then of the building. It's actually the material no, it, itself. It has, it has everything to do with the shape and geometry. Right. The shape and geometry, however, starts with the molecular shape, which will then be fractal to the building shape. Do you get it? Ah, I see. Of course. Yes. So, so when, when, a, when a living seashell is ground up, the paramagnetic and phase conjugate nature of its dielectric, the limestone, is perfect for a building because it's fractal. Now, if you were to arrange that stone into a geometry which is also phase conjugate and fractal, mainly pent or based on golden ratio, you make an electric field that's fractal, microcosmically and macrocosmically. And then you measure the fractality in that air. You can see examples on our website with Karatko's CDV device. And you've measured whether or not it's sacred space. And you've predicted whether or not it'll cause a seed to germinate. So the only way architects should get paychecks is if they build an electric field that causes seeds to grow. Hmm. How about that? That's really interesting. That's, yeah. That's the definition of biologic architecture. We had 300 international specialists in architecture at our first international symposium on biologic architecture. I wrote the curriculum in Mexico City two years ago. This year's conference will be in Cardiff, Wales, in early October. Hmm. Really? Uh, can everyone attend this, or is this close? Sure. Oh, really? No, no, it's a very open event. We have some of the leading biologic architectures, architects of planet Earth, Olda from Prague and Michael Rice from Ireland, goldenmean.info slash architecture. It starts with the film from uh, Ron Eglash presenting fractality in African architecture. So if you, if you see that the shape of the building was a cup shape and then the inside of it, the shape of the, the chief shaman's house hut was a cup shape, 
And then inside that, the altar where he would talk to his elders was also a smaller cup shape, and that's called fractal. And so the place where you can speak with the elders called sacred is the place where the air is fractal due to the fractality of the architecture. Hmm. And that's what Karatkov measured when he measured where the Kogi shaman were able to speak with their shaman, with their elders, their ancestors. That's called fractality in air. That's it, really... corresponds, it corresponds to fractality in water called redox potential, which is a measurability of any liquid to make life. Redox potential. And how do you, tell us a little bit more about how how this was being measured again. Is a particular device or, or, or that measured the electricity in the air or the field around yes. us? Okay. Yes. So let, let's talk about something known first, the example of the liquids. Yes. In liquid, there's something called biologic terrain analysis by uh, bioelectronics of Vincent, Vincent. And basically you measure pH, redox, and resistance. And you can predict the ability of any liquid to support life. It's called biologic terrain analysis. And when you computerize that, analyze urine, blood, saliva, you can do the most profound medical diagnostic. So it turns out that redox potential, which is charge distribution, charge distribution efficiency, or electron availability to react, it defines fractality. So redox potential or fractality, for example, is how you tell if there's cancer in a cell. If the water's fractal, you will not have cancer. It's real, it's very hard, well-known chemistry. Now what's much less known is that fractality in air defines ability to propagate life in exactly the same way because life equals charge distribution efficiency. That's what you mean when you say to be divine. And of course, fractality is what creates distribution efficiency because it's perfect compression and therefore perfect distribution. So fractality in air so far has been measured best with Professor Karatkos device, the GDV gas discharge visualization in St. Petersburg. And we just brought them to UK twice to present at our symposium. You know that the GDV has measured the aura for fractality for years, and that's how we define bliss and teach peak perception. Hmm. Kid, the, you know, the kids who were blind but could see without their eyes, one of the ways you can tell they've achieved bliss or peak perception is their aura gets fractal. Hmm. With the GDV gas discharge visualization, which is basically just the Cadillac of Curlian high voltage, voltage discharge photography. Oh. But apply that to air, basically you're just measuring the ability of a spark to propagate its charge. And the reason you feel bliss in fractal air is precisely because your spark is able to propagate. Mm. So charge propagation efficiency in air is something we desperately need to teach architects. That's basically how you can tell a metal building will kill you, because the air is not fractal inside of it. Mm. Another way to measure that, by the way, is you just take a simple capacitor, it costs 20 cents, and you spectrum analyze the voltage arriving there. If it's harmonically exclusive, that environment will kill a seed. If it's harmonically inclusive, called fractal, that environment will germinate a seed. Explain those terms a little bit more for us. Uh, exclusive, uh, in, in regards to if you take one of these capacitors, uh, let, tell let's, us more about let's that. Let's take, you, take you the aluminum building that a stupid biologist is sitting inside of, and you spectrum analyze the charge in the center of that space, mm -hmm. you find harmonic exclusiveness. The steel and aluminum means that only a very low number of harmonics can be propagate there. Harmonic exclusiveness, that is a low number of present harmonics, any doctor can tell you will mean your heart is going to die. Mm -hmm. It's called HRV. Whereas the opposite, if you're in a building made of paramagnetic and biologic materials and measure the capacitance at the center, you will find rich harmonic inclusiveness, the most number of present harmonics in spectrum analysis. And that predicts fractality and that predicts ability to have and be life, and that's called sacred. Huh. Very, very interesting. And would you say then that, um, I guess that these are interrelated and, and uh, they affect each other and so forth, but what, what I was going to say was, does the environment affect uh, it, the emotional state of, of a human being and is it also the other way around that our emotional state also actually affects the air or the environment around us I, I guess that these two must kind of have some kind of relationship on each other right yeah I think that's why it's called a dialectic <laughs> <laughs> that's no, right I think there's no dialectics wasn't it uh, that's close no but you're right the, the way we summarize that is to say that if you want to survive uh, death and bliss and the solar wind um, your your DNA and your heart and your house and your town and your planet need to have a magnetic map that looks like a rose. That's the summary of fractality in the environment. Hmm. And it's so solar wind, you mentioned as well, because uh, that we can even protect ourselves against dangerous radiation. Is that what you're saying? 
Right. Not that there's any evidence that increased carbon in the atmosphere is associated with temperature increase. They're wrong about that, but that's another question. Well, the okay. Okay, well, yeah, I didn't mean this in the context of global warmer or anything like that, but I just mean well, but that. It's important in the context of global warming as well, because the opposite of warming is non-destructive compression. So if global warming were true, and it's not, then fractality would be the solution. But that's not even the issue. <laughs> the issue is deeper, and that is the solar wind is coming. Yes. And the only, the only way to steer that tornado is to be the center of it, and that requires fractality in the same way that shamans steer tornadoes. Another way to look at it is that the you know when a million children sing at the same moment they measure the change in the solar flares and that Yuri Geller measured that focused human attention reduces radioactivity and Bill Tiller measured that focused human attention compresses charge the reason for all that is that human attention is a phase conjugate dielectric it's a fractal field that's implosive it creates centering force and that's the only way we survive the solar wind it's what the Mayans meant when they said unless the dream spell of the old ones was alive and awake in symmetry space we'd be blown away in the magnetic wind of the sun. Hmm. So uh, can we tie this together then in regards to uh, the potential increase? I remember just a few days ago on our website, we, we published articles that the, that the solar winds, the CME, uh, the corona mass ejections from the sun is, is again picking up. We've been in a very kind of quiet phase at the moment, but this is something that's going to increase, uh, possibly peak around 2011, 2012. Um, would you say that these people who aren't, in a field like this, or in a, even an emotional state, or can focus their attention in this manner, could potentially be, be, be harm, harmed by this? What do you think? It's, it's the same as the situation of the shaman trying to save his village when there's a tornado coming. When you see the bioplasmic sh streamers of the shaman enter the center of the tornado, you know that he's feeling its pain, which is its loss of fractality. And that's the beginning of his being able to steer it. And the same is true of the solar wind, that tornado that comes. So all environments that are fractal will, will experience less heat. All environments that are not fractal will experience more heat in that solar wind, more destructive interference. Mm. Practically speaking, that means, let's give you an example. Uh, in most cities where you have square metal everything, railroads, roads, everything, buildings, that is opposite to fractal, and so that's going to be the first to die. Now, there are some cities, like Prague, which is actually a fractal meteorite crater whose magnetic map is literally a rose that have, has a better chance of survival. And that's the definition of the chem and alchemy, which was invented there in many ways. You're kidding. I didn't know that about Prague. I know that this is an ancient city. I know that the Templars and the Freemasons set up shop there a long time ago. Do you think that they, they got a, an, an eye on this stuff? Well, you know, this is uh, our recent article, goldenmean.info slash science of alchemy, was reviewing Vincent Bridges' film he made with us recently in London, which is there at the website. And, you know, we had taught in our previous conferences in Prague years ago that the magnetic map of Prague is literally a rose. But Vincent pointed out even deeper than that, the early origin of Prague is a volcanic, volcanic crater-like caldera apparently caused by a meteor. And that meteor was a very particular type of meteor, whose, which was a glass. And it had propagated through it, vaporized through it, through the heat of meteoritic arrival, a PGM, platinum group metal, a palladium or um, platinum type metal, that when that vapor propagates through the glass, it creates um, the projective powder the origin of alchemy and the transmutations done by John D, which is why they found that material in Prague. Hmm. Really, we had found in our early earlier visits that it was easier to lucid dream there, but now we understand more of the physics of why. Wow, really? That's that's just incredible. I didn't know that. Do you know if there's other uh, similar locations? Anything you've you've heard about? Well, the principle is what's of interest. We originally learned about this in Australia when our friend Rob Gourlay had measured that the aboriginal song lines were in fact measurable as DC magnetic conductivity in the soil. And where they crossed in a fractal is where they had sacred space. Now, if you think about it, the reason you, you, you can dream along a magnetic track measurable by a phase conjugate or fractal propagation of charge, you can see that that's not only where you can die well, but that's also where you're, you have the possibility of non-destructive compression 
when high plasma voltages arrive in the sun. So the deep principle of Feng Shui is at the root, all the lines connect, and they can only do that in a fractal. Imagine a rose, the rosy cross. Hmm. Very, very interesting. And uh, how would you, in regards, if we talk about this in, in the space of nature, uh, uh, we can talk about later on maybe a city or some of the spaces that are more, I guess, in one way, uh, toxic, toxic that, that human beings have created without this knowledge or built without this knowledge. But if we go into a, a forest, for instance, uh, uh, a nice area in nature, have have you done any kind of measurement there? And, and generally, that's is that always always a good space or good place to be in in regards to the the fractal uh, properties of the location or or are there just some places that are not good for whatever reason well i think it obviously it's, it's true that nature is beauty here but it, it, as an example of how to understand why when krotkov was measuring the, the kids who were able to see without their eyes the exercise they were taught to do was imagine themselves in beautiful nature at that moment he measured that they were flipping an electric switch in their aura and they would become fractal. So even imagining yourself effectively in nature, your aura gets measurably more fractal, triggering the peak perception. But in physics, if, if you simply sit under an ancient tree, an old growth tree, you'll notice that your vision gets more clear. The hmm. physics is that that perception is caused by phase conjugation, perfect compression. So. You know, the way, when Karakov measured golden ratio in brain waves, he was measuring phase conjugation. And that means compression perfected. And that's the cause of perception. And that tree is a perfect electrical branching algorithm. It's fractal. Yeah. And that fractal field is precisely why perception is enhanced. Mm. And it won't, a tree won't grow in any other way either, I guess. I mean, it, it's always going to balance itself perfectly. It's only going to put energy into where it's the least amount of, I guess, in one sense, resistance, or however we want to term that. And therefore, it would all, it, it would always come out in the best way possible, or in accordance with the the trees surrounding. Isn't that right? Yeah, this funny story comes to mind. We were in uh, in Netherlands, and it was a beautiful old forest, but there was one tree that was dying, and we tried to figure out why. We put our spectrum analyzer in the tree, and we got a frequency. I think it was around I don't know 72 hertz, a spike that should not be there in its capacitance. Mm-hmm. And we looked around and we saw there was a large metal fence, a massive iron post, iron fence, about, oh, I don't know, 30 meters away. And the fence was pointing directly at the tree, its corner. Hmm. Now, that is obviously the essence of horrible feng shui. But now we understood the physics. We put our capacitor over that fence and guess what its frequency was? Its frequency was precisely the frequency that was killing the tree. So that, that made the tree harmonically exclusive and no longer inclusive and that's what killed it hmm. that's really interesting so is anything uh that we that we uh, create or shape uh, that that hasn't this uh, type of structure is that gonna um you know kill kill things basically that are living in its surrounding well you know biologists and architectures need to know why every living thing is based on golden ratio five-sided every living protein is five-sided for a reason mm. and if the biologists and architects understood the electrical reason why then they would never put you in a square metal house and <laughs> that's very simple right right and do you think that this is stupidity or is there yes i think it's yes i don't consider myself smart i consider that this stupidity yes and and uh, and and this, so there's no other reason because in one sense what the feeling I'm getting here as well is that um, if we look at some of the more ancient cultures that that, that have specific ways of building their houses we have the uh, the the yurta or whatever it's called from from yes. the Tibetans their their tent which in itself holds a sacred geometry if you will yeah. uh, but somewhere along the line here it seems to be that we the modern quote unquote uh, civilization has lost this knowledge and start to build these square houses what 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 have you picked up on anything the, here what, why yes, did the, they change the essence of the stupidity is not to know what is a bioactive electric field once you understand that for example you could take a wonderful tibetan yurt and if you put wire string around the damn thing you just killed it hmm. so it isn't good enough to just imitate your ancestors you need to know the principle and here's a, here's another really example of the stupidity you have 
millions of people who are paying big money to go to the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, right? Yeah. They're calling that a sacred space. Now, in fact, the paramagnetic stone, the magnetic lines there actually could create charge compression and thus be sacred because it would trigger life. However, the local stupid fools, they surrounded the thing in all kinds of metal wires and ropes. They put metal all over the place really? and killed it. Huh. Now, that is an example of, you know, the gods must be crazy. They're worshiping the Coke bottles. <laughs> well, so there you go. Advice, huh. My advice is stop worshiping Coke bottles and get to the pure principle. Yeah, well, that's right. So, okay, so th that means still uh, then that that uh, at least in, in, in terms of, of some ancient structure, they, they have this incorporated there and, and they've kept that true. But it's the modern man in that sense that, that doesn't get it, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, these people, they call themselves scientists, but they don't have a clue what life is. Hmm. So I have built phase conjugate dielectric capacitors, a resin. And inside that field, I've measured a 50% increase in fermentation by measuring glucose uptake. Mm -hmm. I have made phase conjugate magnetics, phase conjugate magnets, where we've measured up to a 300% increase in growth in water treated with phase conjugate magnetics. Now, physics knows, see, phase conjugation means basically adding and multiplying waves, just like conjugal relations when you get married with your genes. But phase conjugates in optics is well known to create self-organization well-known and time reversal but phase conjugate dielectrics they're just coming to recognize also make self-organization and i've learned how to make phase conjugate dielectrics tom bearden wrote a lot about that hmm. but no one up till now has invented phase conjugate magnetics phase conjugate magnetics which i've invented starts when the, the like poles of a magnet attract each other and at that point you can begin to assemble devices which have an effect on water which will revolutionize all of water purification i mean i'm talking about turning sewage water into drinking water almost directly. Hmm. And, and, and does this mean that, that you, with the, the electromagnetic field, are drawing out all the toxins and the, what's remaining is, is a, a good, clear water? Or how does it work? It's, it works very simply. If you visualize two vortex meeting each other on the head of a pin, like two pine cones coming together head to head, hmm. which is how the two laser beams approach from opposite direction in phase conjugate optics. At that point, when the two tornadoes sw swallow each other head to head, it's called phase conjugate. The symbol is for that is two triangles approaching, which is called the Mogan David. It's the flag of Israel. <laughs> Mogan David. Okay, right. Yeah, but if, if two triangles approach head to head, they phase conjugate, which is the geometry of Orion and a whole bunch of stories. Anyway, <laughs> so if, if you do that with magnetic lines, you create phase conjugate magnetics, and then the light poles of the magnet will attract. And in that geometry, you're creating perfect compression. Now, perfect compression means that the centripetal forces become non-destructive, which means the compression is perfect. It's a perfect squeeze. So water that goes through there experiences phase conjugate magnetics. And it's just like you put it through an incredibly beautiful centrifuge at a molecular level. And out the other side comes increased sedimentation rate. The cause of that is the same reason that you can sort your dirty clothes in your washer by using a spin cycle. Hmm. Very interesting. So is this, um, are you in the process of working with a, with a device that can do this right now? Is it already yes. developed? Or, or? I'm, take, I'm taking my next prototype for Paris for testing tomorrow by water research agencies, yes. There mm -hmm. you go. Okay, really, that's really interesting. And, and what, I mean, have you, you mentioned many different, like what seems to me, me then, uh, I'm not all that familiar with all the things that you've been working on, uh, Dan, but uh, do you have at this point, like devices you mentioned uh, regarding the, uh, the heart, uh, was it tuner you mentioned? or Heart, heart tuner, yeah. Heart tuner, is, is this something that you have available on your website? Or, or tell us more about yes. that. Okay. Yes, at goldenmean.info slash heart tuner special, you'll see my invention, the heart tuner. I invented the mathematics to measure heart coherence. Mm -hmm. It's called a sepstrum. It's a second order power spectra. Just measures the internal phase coherence of your heart. Before this mathematicians thought there was no way to measure internal coherence, I proved them wrong. So when you measure internal heart coherence, you can kind of measure love in a way, because if you say I love you and you're telling the truth, your heart coherence will go up at that instant. And the physics is simple. Perfect coherence is fractal, and that's a perfectly shareable wave. When you measure for phase coherence, uh, you're actually measuring for pure intention, which is literally a wave that's perfectly shareable. Very, very interesting. And, and uh, how about, I'm thinking about when you talked before about um, the Aboriginals, their song and so forth, and if we go back and take that into con uh, context of nature again, I just wanted to ask you, wing this bio, see if you have an input on it. Uh, bird song, I've heard, for instance, is one of these wonderful things that actually um, helps uh, trees to grow. They've, they've, they've taken the free frequency of bird song and measured in two different uh, 
uh, well, I guess in their own kind of controlled environments uh, and came up with the idea that you can even synthesize birdsong and it creates, uh, it ena no, enables pl plants and trees to go f uh, grow faster and bigger. And have you heard about this, Dan? Yeah, the, the sonic bloom invented by Dan Carlson almost 20 years ago now, he was an old friend. They documented the mechanism there. It was that the critical ultrasonic frequencies of the bird's song phase lock the stomach surface on the leaf, massaging increased foliar feeding. Hmm. So the physics is pretty well known on that. But the bottom line was, yes, they were using a trace growth enzyme in a trace mineral spray on the leaves in combination with the bird sounds and achieving exponential growth increase. It's called Sonic Bloom, Dan Carlson. Very interesting. Okay, well, well, then it's known then. It is something that just... Uh... Uh, came came by me the, the other day. I haven't heard more about it. So I didn't know that it was this this elaborate, and I think people have been working on it for for such a long time. Uh, but but there's other things here as well in regards to well, you talk about bliss all the time, for instance, or the science of bliss and and how this can be uh, achieved. Is this something? Would you say that that we have we can work on internally in regards to how we deal with our own emotions, or have you looked at it prim this primarily from the perspective of having a an external uh, device with a specific frequency or voltage or electric man magnetic field that influences us? Yes, we, we'd like to suggest the focus be on what's called self-empowerment, which is the ability to make bliss for yourself from within. But the fact is the electrical definition of bliss is very teachable. And that is when your body gets fractal as identified by golden ratio in the power spectrum. For example, when Karakoff measured peak perception or bliss in the kids who could see without their eyes, one of the primary determinants was golden ratio in EEG, brainwave harmonics, and specifically golden ratio in the ratio of the key frequency of alpha versus beta in your brainwaves. So I built an invention based on that idea of golden ratio in EEG to teach bliss, called the bliss tuner, mm -hmm. the first of its kind. And indeed, we can teach bliss process. And the nice thing is that when you use biofeedback to teach, you to shift gears in your brainwave to achieve golden ratio, which is harmonic inclusiveness optimized. When you make golden ratio in your brainwaves, you experience charge compression, and that's called bliss and peak perception. And we've had people make as many as five harmonics in golden ratio. There's lots of precedent for this academically for people who are deep into neurofeedback. Uh, goldenmean.info slash clinical intro to see the whole story of the history of the measurement of bliss. But it's now quite clear that bliss and peak perception are defined by fractality or phase conjugation optimized by golden ratio. It's very teachable. The point is that as the more you're able to achieve the bliss state, the more your aura gets big. And that's a predictor of your ability to take memory through death as predicted by ability to lucid dream. Uh, tell us more about that. The memory through death, it, it, to me, sounds... A little bit like life after death, death but I guess it, that it, it implies that we personally aren't there in one sense, but, but our memories are, are taken on further, or, or uh, they're living on further beyond us. Or, or Tell us about it. What do you mean? Yes, we have four or five one-hour videos on our website about teaching the science of successful death from an electrical engineering viewpoint. Again, some of this was inspired by our friend Dr. Karatkov in Russia, his book Life After Life. Life After Life. He, he measured the time it takes for your aura to leave your body after death, and then he measured where the electric field of your ghost goes after death, which is, by the way, the place of compression called fractal or sacred space, kind of the castanata place of power defined electrically. But even prior to that work, you had the Heinrich Kluve form constants, where large numbers of near-death experiencers reported on the sequence of the geometry of their vision during death. And it turns out lattice cobweb tunnel spiral to be a sequence of fold symmetry operations based on the sequences symmetry foldings your own DNA. Basically you're enacting the operations of braiding in order to allow your aura, your electric field to compress and that gives you the ability to propagate the charge which is called memory through death. Hmm. So there is a map to dying just like I'll follow a map to Paris tomorrow and that map is well known, it's teachable and uh, your ability to navigate that realm, even suggested by the Tibetan Book of the Dead or the Voynich Manuscript, yeah. is proportional to the amount of coherence in the aura you take with you at death. 
So an electrical engineer should inform you of the best place and mechanism of death. <laughs> and obviously the, the hospital is the worst possible place because it's opposite to fractal and the electrus mod. Huh. So, so our does, ancient, does, does that mean that if we die in a hospital that our memory are, are lost and not absorbed into the, the, the field, if you will? Well, I mean, obviously there are some people that are coherent enough to be able to handle some of that, I suppose, sure, but sure. clearly it's, it's opposite to ideal. Our Anunnaki ancestors would go to something like the bed at Machu Picchu, which is profoundly electrically fractal, which is precisely the correct place to die, because from there your charge is able to propagate. <laughs> and that is the definition of successful death, because you will find your memory. Your, it's, it's very simple. If you can lucid dream, you've got a good shot at death. All right. And so. the lucid the physics of lucid dreaming is very teachable. Hmm. And again, is that something that we can, uh, uh, that you've been working on in regards to uh, external devices and how you can uh, better enable yourself to lucid dream? Or is this an internal thing again? Or uh, Well, you know, years ago we were working with Terry Patton. You, you click on toolsforexploration.com and you order a lucid dreaming kit and you get a little device that senses rapid eye movement and will do partial awakening. But at a much deeper level, preparing yourself to lucid dreams starts with getting, you know, yoga, charge dense food and a magnetic map of your bed so that you're able to get your aura propagating. What is one of the most important, most important things you can do for yourself is make a magnetic map of your bed. Okay. And, and how, how do people do that then? <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, having a bit of dousing skill is survival related. That's for starters. Because okay. if you can't feel a magnetic line, you can't feel. Right. Once you begin to feel a few magnetic lines, and you could get help on this, then you get the idea that your aura is at its most susceptible during sleep and death. And so if your bed is not located with reasonable fractality, you're in trouble. Hmm. And you mentioned uh, charged, dense food as well. Is there any examples you can give people? You know, our, our courses are, we, we start out with this whole story. It's called um, Implosion, Secret Science of Ecstasy and Immortality, which is uh, my fourth book. It's in about five languages. It's on the website. Um, and the first half of the book is for teenagers, you know, like you were willing to risk death in order to get bliss. And guess what? You were correct. It's worth risking your life to get because without it, you don't get an immune system and you don't survive death because you don't acquire enough charge. But once you get motivated to see that that's the only way to get immortal, then there's a homework assignment. And the homework assignment is the hygiene. And the hygiene is called a charge acquiring lifestyle. And that's based on diet, yoga, and environment largely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and yes, in the dietary area, we teach that charge dense food, life force in food, and you all know what that is. It means live food. About 50 to 80 percent of your diet needs to be live enzyme food because the heat that killed the enzyme killed the life force and digestion is implosion by definition. So then you, you learn that you should avoid eating angry DNA because you're eating DNA whose ability to share its charge has been destroyed monocultured wheat, corn, and soy are examples of angry DNA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The D DNA in wheat, corn, and soy by millennia of monoculture is angry enough to cause mucus and destroy your immune system. So you need DNA that's experienced genetic diversity. That yes. will tell you if, the, if that DNA is going to be able to feed your aura. Fa'atun, feed the aura, fatin. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of stories about diet. You know most of those stories. But it boils down to being able to have a charged, dense uh, uh, diet. Yes. And, you know, high quality protein is critical and hard to find, actually. Hmm. You know, how, do you, how do you get a happy chicken? That sort of question. Okay, that's, so, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, in, in regards to seeds, again, I just want to ring, uh, wing this bio as well because I'm thinking of, we have all, you know, you know, you know the stories as well, what, what's going on and what's happening right now in regards to how uh, how the genetic diversity in many seeds is uh, being taken away and this is even being I mean, stored up here in, in uh, close to the North Pole, up in, in Svalbard, you know, the global seed vault that they're building right there. There, there they have the, all the good seeds right now with all the genetic diversity. And what we're being offered right now is the uh, Monsanto-approved uh, genetic yeah. seeds, you know. And uh, 
Right. Now, I, I firmly believe the Monsanto approach should be illegal because it's against the laws of nature. Yeah. But what Mo Monsanto needs to know, and I don't think they're evil, I just think they're stupid, is that the ability to self-organize at the core of DNA depends precisely on fractality, which is identical with genetic diversity. Hmm. That fundamental truth should be the end of Monsanto as a company in the present form. Well, I guess that's where we differ a little bit. Then I actually do consider them to be evil and even consciously of what they're doing because the way well, that they're it, expanding. It, it, and, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, maybe we shouldn't argue about that whether sure, they're evil or stupid. Uh, sure, sure. Maybe absolutely. that's a trivial question. And, and you know, I, we we don't want to condemn anybody. I I would prefer to believe that they're stupid, but whatever. Whatever. Well, sure. I mean, in any regards, the the fruit of what they're doing is is equally stupid and and wrong at this point. So that's, but, that's something know, that, we can that agree with. That gets into a much bigger picture, which is the the history and tradition of loss of genetic diversity, which came right from Alpha Draconis, the Draco Anunnaki story. So you know, that's. Yeah. That's a galactic history, historical question. Well, exactly, but, that, but that's interesting. Do you, do you consider that the the technology, if if you will, and the the science and knowledge of what the things that you are talking about today, that that's been passed down to us from 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 these uh, from these other civilizations? Well, the, the essential conflict in the, the pre-Anunnaki, which we now know came from Alpha Draconis and the Pleiades, and I do recommend Anton Park's work, the Chronicles of Girku, uh, to see the history of Enki and the Draco. But in the, in the classic, traditional, conservative draconian culture, what you might be called Nephilim, meaning l the fallen loss of ability to implode DNA, in that culture, uh, any DNA that changed was defined as defective. Hmm. And that's, that's the tragedy, because in that culture produced the fallen seraphim, Gabriel, who narrated the origin of Christianity, Mormons and the Muslim and the uh, Muslim came from the same source, Gabriel, who was conservative seraphim genetic politics. And that was a genetic politics that was profoundly mistaken to believe that you could not set DNA free when, in fact, the opposite is necessary. Hmm. Um, there, there are a few researchers who suggest even that human beings are genetically engineered by uh, by other people from other worlds. Uh, do, do you think that that's the case or are we in a perfect accordance with the, nature and the creation of the universe in that sense? The, gal the galactic core cultures, something called the Kadistu, which were some of the original genetic planners behind the seraphim from which we get the word Caduceus, uh, which is the symbol of Hermes, who was the, the sort of grandson of and some more DNA and doctors of Caduceus, which is called phase conjugation in physics. So that lineage from the Kadistu side of the family recognized the need for genetic diversity early on, which is why they established Earth as a kind of genetic library from which all these cultures could draw. Unfortunately, you don't qualify to have a library card unless you know what DNA is for. And current <laughs> genetic engineers don't. Right. Huh. DNA is designed to make the gravity to hold stars together. Hmm. And, uh, and now when we are beginning to tamper with this, now when we are coming into this age, uh, where do you see that that's going? Is it going to, or I mean, do you think we're going to create monsters in the laboratory that, that totally is going to, you know, Run amok on the surface, or where, surface, or where, where, where is this going in, in what you can see? Will this create disease in some kind, or, or, yeah. you know, could well, we, could we wipe us out if, if I phrase it like that, if we tamper with this too much? Yeah, loss of genetic freedom is directly re related to how Atlantis sank. It's, it's the old story. But the funny part of this story, I like to sell it, is called the Golden One story by Reiki Rakeup. He says, you know, the, the Anunnaki Draco, they went 300 years into our future and they saw all these stars blowing up and they went backwards in time to figure out when it when stars started blowing up so much and they realized it was when we started genetic engineering here mm -hmm. dna gets dizzy and gravity gets dizzy and so they went backwards in time and settled in sumeria and they were called the anunnaki they did groundhog day so, so the, the, the real issue here is you keep trying to get it you get it right it it's just that in the same way, your kids don't get smart unless you set them free. Your DNA has the same problem. Hmm. That's a good point. <laughs> very, very interesting. Uh, and, and this is pretty much you take as uh, uh, a theory, or is this fact to you at this point? You know that this has happened uh, in, in your own worldview, so to speak, in well, regards to the Anunnaki and all this stuff, of course. Uh, I think the history story is very optional. I mean, I don't think it's important whether people agree on me, with me on the history story. I think the history story, and I do recommend Anton Parks, I think he's much better than Sumerian or Sitchin, 
But right. Uh, right. The, the history story of Enki, in my view, is a wonderful, much better than Star Wars story. But even the reason for telling the story is only to get you interested in the principles to do the homework. Right, right. The principles is the physics of fractality and genetic diversity, and the homework is the hygiene to have bliss. Mm. The history story is just a way to get the kids motivated. Mm. The history is a short no- nightmare that would be well to wake up from. Um, before we uh, we round things up here for this first hour, Dan, uh, and continue talking more here in our member section, why don't you mention uh, your website again and primarily mention where people can go in order to find uh, more of, of your videos and books uh, and, and so that they can gain more material of, of what it is that you're producing, Dan? Yes. In the main index at goldenmean.info, you see the section on the courses and the online video library on the books. There's also five language links there and uh, the entire index in date sequence. It's one of the world's largest private websites, certainly the world's largest private video library. We get a million hits a month. It's the central index for the whole thing. It's right there at goldenmean.info. Mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, so uh, we're talking with Dan Winter. The website is goldenmean.info. Uh, info. Uh, we're going to take a short break here, and we're going to return and talk more in the member section. But thank you very much for this uh, segment, Dan. Stay with us, and we will be right back. Thanks for caring. Thank you for listening to our first segment with Dan Winter. Join us in our member section for much more. We are going to talk about architecture, houses, building materials, straw bale houses, electrosmog, Wi-Fi and cell phone signals. We're also going to talk about clothing and certain kinds of jewelry with uh, metals and uh, iron in them. We are also going to talk about the sun, uh, the eye of the sun, uh, and the sun as the true stargate, if you will, as a jumping point. Uh, We're going to talk about organic crafts, uh, different type of vehicles made of DNA. Very, very interesting. And uh, the hollow nature of the moon uh, and the idea that it's actually an artificial object that has been towed here by another civilization. Uh, We'll also talk about brainwaves, some of the experiments at the Monroe Institute, astral parasites, ectoplasm, and... uh, and we have Dan with us today to primarily talk about the, um, the science uh, of, of alchemy, this very, very interesting and uh, esoteric uh, teaching, as it were. We're going to get into this in some more detail later on in the program, but uh, at the beginning we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, Dan's background and uh, uh, present a little bit some of his uh, work to you. Uh, I also want to mention his website that you can take a look at right away. It's goldenmean.info. Uh, goldenmean.info and it's a website uh, simply packed with information. It's articles, uh, images, uh, graphs and videos. There's so much for people who are new to dance work to dig into right there. Uh, But with that, uh, welcome to the uh, program, Dan. Thank you very much for coming on. It's uh, great of you to spend some of your time with us here today. Thanks, Henrik. I'm enthused to share. It's great. It's great to have you with us. And and again, as I mentioned here, your website is, is vast. There's just tons of material on there for people to dig into. So what I like to do in a way of kind of introducing you and I guess some of the work that you uh, have presented on your website, uh, I guess you primarily use this as a kind of a platform where you uh, present your findings and the new things that you that you uh, do, that you're researching. And um, maybe you, you can just tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this or if you have any uh, academic or scientific uh, education or in, in, in the background, so to speak here. Uh, and, and also, if you will, um, how uh, maybe you can mention to us a little bit about how your uh, the main thesis, I guess, of, of your work or, or how this has been developed for you in regards to the golden mean or, or the golden ratio. Yes, a lot of wonderful stuff. Well, you know, we I've been traveling and teaching for almost 30 years. I have a wonderful partner, Valerie, here, and we have a, a million hits a month on our website. Um, <clears throat> currently, the focus of the work is that in fact fractality or self-similarity idealized by the golden mean ratio is in fact the the mechanism behind all centripetal forces and that would include the good so i've I've been on my uh, on my own focus for a long time and uh, i've kind of uh, not looked back you know yes how how about these days i mean do you feel that uh, there's a uh, more interest about these type of uh, subjects, or, or is it still uh, on the same level as it were when you s- first started out? Well, you know, um, governments and institutions are very entrenched. And, uh, you know, I, I lectured at, um, to the PhD medical students with uh, Gary um, in, um, 
University of Arizona Tucson um, Medical School in the cardiology department. And places like that, and I also lectured to PhD physics students at the University of Pittsburgh. And, you know, they're quite with you when you talk about um, coherent emotion using power spectrum measure harmonics. But when you start talking about fractality being the cause of gravity, and that was 15 years ago, they, they I mean, they, they thought you were crazy. And now the best mathematicians in the world, El Nashi and others, have agreed with me that fractality is the cause of gravity. But at that time, you know, it was like too far out. Hmm. Uh, uh, in regards to uh, Nassim Harriman, who we had actually on this program a while back now, uh, are, are you uh, have you split in 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 regards to what what you guys are working on in, independently, or or do you still feel very much that he's still on the ball, and and is that in accordance with your I guess main theory that you're developing? Well, you know, Nassim is a great guy, and I have great respect for him, and he was kind enough to come to the first international Budapest International Physics of Consciousness. Unified Field Symposium at my suggestion, um, and then I sponsored him at our recent Physics Conscious Symposium in Suffolk, UK. Um, you know, we had that fun dialogue for a long time where I was trying to convince them that stellated tetrahedron are not fractal. <laughs> the, the, but the point, Nassim has really come around beautifully. He really sees the universe as being, uh, the, everything is a black hole as a kind of way of putting it, which is what alchemy is about. And he's really come around to the physics of golden mean ratio, He's done some great work on bioactive electric fields. You know, Nassim has, has done some good work on teaching. Rotkoff in St. Petersburg, the GDV, he's been very close to me in the last couple of years. And so, you know, I've I've been privileged to be trained with the best. Really? That's very uh, Arthur Young, is that the guy behind Bell Helicopters? Yes, yes. Um, really? I stayed really? at his estate in Pennsylvania and played with his Rolls Royce collection and discussed <laughs> deep philosophy about his, his reflexive universe. And, I mean, I, I knew I was privileged to be with all the best teachers of the day, Bill Tiller and all those people were friends. That's interesting because I've heard a lot about, well, I don't know if they had a particular name, this group, but I know that Puharic, as you mentioned, Andrea Puharic, yes. Arthur Young mm -hmm. and a few of these other people, they were very, yes. very interested in different spiritual uh, yes. fields. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. They were into yeah. the... Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the turning point in those days was something called the Fundamental Physics Group at Berkeley with Elizabeth Rauscher was leading, and we've had so much fun even recently. And now she's with Nassim Haramine sometimes, and he's also a friend. But then there was the big International Physics of Consciousness Symposium in Toronto and also at the Harvard. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we were together with Tiller and Bill Tiller and Ben Toff and Puhark. And it was a big party there for many years. We were with that group. So I was kind of the whiz kid of that generation. Oh, really? Well, that's that's really interesting. And and have, have you guys worked together with, uh, well, let us say, larger uh, c corporations that have, that have been in some way shown interest in these t type of fields because they want to know more, they want to in some way maybe uh, ha have inventions or they want to utilize this knowledge in regards to medical industry or, or have you pretty much funded your own work? How's that came, come about? Well, you know, of course I was with IBM for a long time and then our family business in Western New York, I was the Sparky the electrical engineer and I was doing alternative electric motor nonlinear energy device technologies uh, like Bruce De Palma was a friend, and Tom Vallone actually lived with me for a while. So all the nonlinear energy device technology people, and I did keynote lectures for many years for Psychotronics International in USA. But uh, actually, in terms of large corporate support, I think we were too uh, rebellious and revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> but for many years, Mystic and Bliss Dance, as well as the Gurdjieff uh, worldview, the Enneagram, and all that stuff. So I was trained in that tradition. And then I, I was a, a working um, electrical engineer for many years, although during that time I, I traveled. I, I had, um, I guess you would call it deep initiatory experiences in, in the pyramids and in, in, in Peru and in, um, in Scandinavia. And, you know, I've traveled, traveled too much, actually. <laughs> well, I mean, again, your background is, is uh, you have so, so much uh that you've been, been studying in so many different fields. And I guess that uh, what is interesting to me is that you've been in electrical uh, engineering. And many people, of course, looking into this idea of the, about the electrical universe and even the electrical nature of, of the human body, for instance. As, would you say that that is something was, that has laid the ground, if you will, for your discoveries when it comes to, um, uh, when you talk about human emotion, for instance, that, that they actually are el electrical in nature? Yes, that's exactly what we're saying, precisely that even as the plasma universe people are talking about modeling astrophysics as, as waves of plasma and clouds of plasma, 
it's also true that that's what happens during emotion is that you have a coherent emotion, you get fractal, you implode, and that organizes the plasma field you call your aura. And its fractality is a measure of your bliss and a measure of whether you will take memory through death. In, I, I wanted to say in terms of um, my background that I've been privileged to work personally extensively with some of the world's most wonderful teachers. And I'd, I'd like to mention some of their names. I, was, yes. I spent y- years working with Ben Bentoff. Um, he called me his, his uh, guardian angel at one point. And I, of course, worked with Arthur Young and worked with Bucky Fuller personally for a long time. We worked in several cities together. I, I, um, I trained with, um, oh, uh, well, I, Bill Tiller was a friend and Andrew Puharik was close. And currently I work a lot with Elizabeth Brousher and uh, just, uh, you know, some of the world's greatest teachers. And, and Professor the Cause of Gravity and the Cause of Color, the Cause of Perception, the Cause of Bliss. Um, and the cause of life force, actually. Uh, and th- indeed, it is the precise mechanism called grail and uh, alchemy, the, the black hole principle, which is what alchemy is about. So it's about fractality. That's what it is. And um, so, but you asked about my background. That's a good place to start. Yes, yes. So I, I was um, educated at University of Detroit. Initially, my undergraduate work was electrical engineering, magna cum laude. My graduate work, which was incomplete, was a master's in psychophysiology and basically um, biofeedback. I was a polygraph operator. In our graduate research lab, we were the first to discriminate with my mentor, Albert Axe, who was one of the inventors of biofeedback. We were one of the first to discriminate the electrical nature of emotion, particularly fear and anger. Really? And so it, it set me on a lifelong involvement in teaching and actually inventing biofeedback devices, currently the heart tumor and the bliss tumor are my inventions. And the concept of heart coherence, I'm credited in the literature with inventing because I developed the math to measure heart coherence and later taught heart math to take their first EKG and how to do the spectrum analysis of the EKG. So it's been a long, a long time, but yes. mostly the focus has been around the physics of consciousness, which is what we call many of our seminars. And recently with the Feng Shui seminars.com, teaching the physics and the science behind Feng Shui. Uh, after uh, university, um, I was a systems analyst trained with IBM. I trained in Detroit, Chicago and Poughkeepsie, although I was only with them for a year. I, it turns out that my teacher in the IBM systems analyst training school was a student of Gurdjieff and Mm, Long really? story, I, I ended up in the uh, in the Gurdjieff uh, Sacred Gymnastics uh, Training School, uh, Sacred Academy in Claymont.org in West Virginia, and learned sacred gymnastics.